Hey guys. Um, so my name is Michelle Burkett. Thank you so much for the introduction, Jim, and for always being a, a good supporter. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about Network Canvas. Um, so Network Canvas is a software tool that um, we've been fun. No, he, we've turned it on. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, awesome. Also, I am very sick, and so I have no idea how long my voice is going to hold out, so hopefully this works. Um, and also, apologies. I'm trying not to like you know shake hands too much with anybody, interact too much. Um, so anyways, so Network Canvas is a software tool that um, my team's been working on for quite some time. Um, and so it's exciting. We've, we've been able to do presentations um, every summer um, at this workshop over the last several years. This is the first time um, that I, we're really able to show like what we've been really working on, which is great. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit, um, you know, I only have an, about an hour today. I'm going to do a little bit of background pretty quickly. Um, and then I want to shift into, one, showing you guys a video, um, which is a, a preview of our video. So it's not the final, but um, it does a nice job sort of like explaining the tool and, and showing some visuals. And then I want to show you guys the actual software. Um, and then give you guys some updates on you know what our plans are. Um, so um, this is our team. Um, so I'm just one person of this team of folks, and the people pictured I would say would be you know the core sort of members who've been a part of this from the beginning. Um, but there's a lot of other folks too who've been a part of this. Um, and so this work uh, is really a collaboration amongst folks who are from all different places. Um, and so I'm at Northwestern in the medical school. Um, as well as Pat Janoulis and Gregory Phillips. I'm a counseling psychologist by background. Gregory's an epidemiologist. Pat is a community psychologist. Bernie Hogan and Josh Mezzel um, come from sociology, and um, Bernie is currently at the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, been there for a number of years. Josh um, was his uh, like graduate student and then has become our full-time uh, lead developer for the project. Um, so these folks, you know, we've we all kind of approach this our work in a little bit different ways, and it's really been the coming together of all these different, um, like n different domains, different areas of expertise that I think has been able to make a, a really nice product that will be useful for a wide variety of folks. Um, yeah, and so let me kind of just give a little bit of background of like you know where this project started. So there's a lot of different ways that you can represent network data, um, and some of them are more intuitive than others. So there's, you know, the matrices uh, that, you know, absolutely are great for representing network data, but not very intuitive and not very um, maybe uh, good at sort of, uh, you can't glance at it and sort of uh, understand what it means. And so when it comes to data capture, um, approaches that are more visual, more hands-on, more tactile seem to work actually really well. Um, and so some of this work has been um, led by uh, uh, Bernie um, with this use of the participant aided sociogram or this idea of like doing a network interview where you're really creating these tactile objects that are you know being uh, manipulated you're drawing lines between them you're moving around pieces of paper um, and you're creating these connections in a way that is in a very intuitive sort of way um, and so I was actually like starting to use some of these approaches and so my work is on HIV I do a lot of public health work, and I'm interested in understanding the social networks of young men in Chicago, trying to understand you know, major disparities in HIV. And trying to implement some of this work in, in the real world, um, it's, it's great in some ways. Um, the, this sort of physical approach is very intuitive for participants. But when you're really getting into trying to get a lot of data, about each of the individuals that are being nominated, like age, sexual relationship, sexual history with that person, what specific behaviors, um, what is your relationship with that person, what's the race of that person, maybe also information about the ties between that person of like, well, when was the first time you had sex, when was the last time you had sex, how many times in between, all these things that are like really important when it comes to really understanding the transmission of HIV and what may be driving it. Um, it's extremely tedious. So this is actually like from one of our studies. This is blinded. But you know, we were doing whiteboards. We are drawing lines. We were taking pictures of the whiteboard. And then we're translating that picture into like 
it was UCI Net, um, making networks on there. And then we were doing this three different times because we had social relationships, we had sexual relationships, and we had drug relationships. This is uh, relationships between alter alters, so not just legal alters, but alter alters. So it was a lot, and it took years to get from, it was this first data collection with 175 guys interviews, and um, getting it from both from data capture to um, actually to a place where we can analyze the data and start writing it up, it took about two years. Um, a huge number of resources, um, and just a lot of time. So um, another really large, amazing study came up called RADAR. RADAR is a UL1 cohort funded by NIDA um, to capture uh, the sexual, well, not just sexual, but trying to understand um, young, men and, young men who have sex with men in Chicago, trying to understand from all these different levels, so individually, um, what are their health behaviors, um, trying to understand their social, sexual, and drug networks, and then also trying to understand um, biologically. So getting data at all these different levels. Um, with this project, though, we could not use the typical methods. Um, we could not take two years. Um, with this number of participants, and then also with you know trying to get these guys in every six months, getting all this two mil data. So that was really what spurred a lot of this collaboration um, with Bernie and Josh and trying to figure out how can we move the participant ADSP associate grant into something that's computerized, something that um, can really cut down um, in terms of you know all of the effort that's going in and on the researcher side, on the participant side, to really streamline things. So some of our requirements for this, you know, um, it needed to be very easy for participants because they were getting blood drawn, they were getting all kinds of things. They were filling out an hour red cap survey in addition to the network stuff. And so trying to figure out how can we make the network portion very easy, very simple, intuitive for them. And then also being able to get, you know, a lot of data about a lot of different individuals, um, alter alter connections, trying to get complex note and edge attributes, um, and dynamic data, skip patterns, all kinds of things, just so that like, people aren't entering the same thing over and over again, trying to make it very simple from a participant standpoint. So what we did was Network Canvas. Um, I'm gonna show you a little bit more. I'm not gonna show you too, too much at this moment, but I can say that that's where you know, really Network Canvas sort of happened. Um, and we did an you know, evaluation of it. Um, what people said in, in this one uh, you know, protocol of a network canvas is they really liked it. Like participants like flew through the interview, we're getting a ton of data. We've captured, so radar is actually up for the renewal. And so we've actually captured like five waves of data with these 1,200 guys already. Um, and likely, you know, this will be um, renewed as well. Um, but what participants have said is that like it's it was actually really cool and very quickly they sort of um, were able to you know not just like give us the data but like give it in a way that was like very easy for them like it was just like okay I'm good it, there's an interviewer here but they didn't really need us at that moment they were just like okay I got it you know this was good and so it really helped solidify this idea that good design can make this kind of really complex data capture like really simple um, so. Yeah, let me talk a little bit about Network Canvas. So um, these are some of our guiding principles. I just want to like talk through these and then I'm going to switch to looking at a, a video that will help give you guys a little bit more understanding. And so with Network Canvas, the difference between the what we did originally for, for, for Radar, Network Canvas for Radar was really a protocol built for one study. When people started seeing what we were doing for Radar, we got a lot of outreach from people who were like, that's amazing, can you do that for our study? And even for myself, I was thinking, I wanna do this in the future, I never want to go back to the methods that I was doing before, but how can I do that? Because it took a lot of work, it took a lot of figuring out you know, how to do this, it takes a lot of you know, technical expertise in modifying our protocols and getting the data and just all kinds of things. Um, and so what we decided to do was to write a grant that would um, allow us to really build a software that would allow you to build protocols just like we did, just like we did for Network Canvas. Um, and so that's what our software is. And so we talk about three different components. Okay, the first one, um, skip ahead real quick. So this first one is um, called the architect. And so that's when you're 
um, actually designing the interview protocol. So that's the tool for designing the interview protocol. Um, and then you can kind of think of it as like when you're building a Qualtrics survey, you know, or REDCap survey or something like that, you're going through and you're entering in the questions. It's just like that. But the difference here is that it's really made for network data. So some parts of that that look differently, as, as you'll see, it's very visual. So whereas in REDCap, you're, you don't have a lot of control over like the visual style of the interface, you're really just specifying like the question, the text. But what is actually very important here is how things visually look and how um, sort of the objects you're interacting with on the screen, how they sort of fit together and how they're stored on the back end. And so we've created a number of different um, interface interfaces that you sort of insert, sort of like a PowerPoint, like you have like a certain design that you're like, okay, I want this kind of slide and I want this kind of slide. It's kind of like that. Um, so that's the architect. And then the next app is, um, it's called an Organize app, really creative name. Um, and so that is what is actually deploys your protocol as you build it. So you build the protocol and you load it in to um, the Network Canvas app. The app is going to be installed on whatever machine you are collecting data on. So for like some of our studies, you might have, I might brought an iPad around, you might have 10 iPads, and that's, those are the study machines. And all of your interviewers are going to be deploying your interview on these machines. So the cool thing about that is that you can automatically sort of have one protocol that if you make a shift someplace, you can update all of your machines at once. And you're not having to worry about having all of these different survey protocols floating around on different iPads, different machines, different pieces of hardware. You can also tell where your data came from, which piece of machinery did it come from, um, what interviewer, those sorts of things. So like we're trying to think about this from like a very like study, study management sort of perspective. So again, architect is what actually deploys the protocol. It is very visual. It is uh, really, um, touch is a big part of our, of our um, software. I think it, it really makes, you don't need touch in order to do this. You can use a mouse, you can you know, use you know, traditional desktop, that's totally fine. But we find that participants really seem engaged when you're touching and it's just a very intuitive interaction when you're like creating nodes, moving them around the screen and then creating edges with fingertips. It's just very intuitive. Um, so if possible, touch is great and iPads are wonderful. Um, we also, okay, so that's architect. And then I'm gonna move to the third app, which is server. So server is where your data then comes back to you. And so server is installed on whatever computer is gonna be doing this data management. Um, likely this is the researcher's computer. And server can, um, you know, easily sort of um, receive the data. And so what you would do from architect, I'm sorry, from app is on your iPad after the study is over, you're gonna export it and it goes to server and it confirms that everything's there. And so what server does, it, it brings in all this data back into one place. It gives you some really big overview kind of stuff of like how many interviews, what are the average number of alters received per interview, what are, you know, what dates did these interviews come at? So you can do a little bit of like high level monitoring of your data and then you can export it out in a GraphML, in a uh, CSV file, um, into whatever software you want to use, whether it's R, whether it's Gatsby, you know, whatever it is. Um, so that's like very high overview of everything. Um, let me switch real quickly to showing you guys a video, which can actually probably tell you all this stuff a little bit better. <laughs> The science of networks has been growing for quite a while and we know from that science that people's attitudes and their behaviors are in large part influenced by the networks in which they are embedded. The question then is how do we find out what are the networks in which people are embedded? When we want to understand what drives a complex behavior or causes one group to experience the world differently from another, we need to look to the structural contexts in which people are embedded. This is why we created Network Canvas, a collection of software designed to simplify complex network data collection. 
Network Canvas is a tool that allows researchers to collect data about the social systems around a person and trying to make it as easy as possible, both for the participant and then also for the researcher. And this is to really help people who might not know anything about network data collection to actually be able to do this research. We sort of learn firsthand by just struggling with um, the amount of effort and resources that it really took to collect good data. Especially the work I do around HIV, it's not just individual level factors, it's these more complicated sexual, social network factors. And if people can't collect that data, they can't measure it. We found ourselves building our own solutions and just realized that everybody sort of needed something that we were building in order to capture this data. Because network data is complex, it's famously difficult to capture, manage, and store. This is why Network Canvas is made up of three separate apps. It has a tool for survey design, a tool for interviewing, and a tool for secure data management. Each of the applications has its kind of has come from a, a different challenge that we faced, you know, using this type of data and creating this, uh, these interviews and deploying them. Architect is where you'll design and implement your study. Here, you can easily model the nodes and edges you want to capture and create as many variables as you'll need to store their attributes. You can also define the stages of the interview by choosing one of the many tailor-made interfaces we've created and customizing its functionality to suit your needs. You can add prompts using rich text, set up special behaviors like bringing in data from an external file, and preview the experience that your participants will have right from within the app. You know, the architect was out of the, the need previously to kind of hand program every uh, questionnaire. We've been, we've been lucky enough to work with folks that can do that, um, but we know that you know, we can't do that ourselves and many people don't have those kind of uh, opportunities. So Architect really takes that away and you know, using a very graphical intuitive interfaces, uh, you can build your interview uh, to deploy. The Network Canvas app is where your participants will complete your study. Designed around the face-to-face -face interaction between interviewer and participant, the app runs on a wide variety of devices, including tablet and desktop computers. Each interface your participants see has been specifically designed around the data collection requirements of a network interview. Our interfaces are strongly visual and use consistent interactions such as dragging and tapping to collect high quality data without high response burden. Network Canvas is meant to be done as an app on a tablet or on a computer by an interviewer with somebody else. And what we're trying to do is provide a very coherent experience so that the people that are doing this feel like it's their network and that they understand the process. The third of our apps is called Server. It provides a way to deploy your interview protocol to your study devices and securely receive data back from them. You can see the data you've collected in real time from your overview dashboard. When you're ready, you can export your data for further analysis in the software of your choosing. We didn't stop at Network Canvas. We, we built a server, or the Network Canvas server. So that's a, that's a secure server that a person can run on, on a computer in their lab that will then connect to Network Canvas field devices. And then those devices will send that data securely back to the researcher's own computer. It's never going on Dropbox or on Google or anywhere else. It's meant to be a secure uh, feature. Even when we had this really cool, uh, you know, a previous version where we could uh, collect this data with a visual interface, um, we had tremendous difficulties getting that data out, um, being able to manage that, monitor it, um, and then get it in a usable format. Um, so the server application dramatically kind of simplifies that process where we can get uh, the data very quickly off the interview devices and into you know, whatever analysis program folks want to use. Our goal is to provide a completely free set of software for the research community that is open, extendable, high quality, and built for the needs of researchers of all kinds. We are certainly hoping that in the long term a project like this will grow organically as we go further. And so one of the ways in which that will happen is having people who might have slightly different application contexts and see how they might be able to adapt this in those particular contexts. And we welcome those opportunities. I'm really excited to see this in practice being used in people's studies, in lower resource settings, in places where people who couldn't normally use network data collection tools are able to do it. 
It's important to have people who can do this, not just in academic institutions with a lot of support, but also at public health departments and community-based organizations and smaller places that might value this data and know it's important, but not actually be able to collect it or use it on their own. The important part of Network Canvas is that um, it is open source, it is open to the community, um, it does not cost anything, and we built it that way because we feel like it's so important to sustain the, the program, we really need the involvement of the community. So hopefully if people have, you know, uh, they have a totally different idea of what they would like within the interview, um, within the server application, within the architect, then they can go ahead and edit that, modify it, and you know, uh, then everyone can use those tools as well. This is just the first step. We're exploring what are other ways that we can utilize this technology and similar methods to um, make it easier to understand each individual's world and how can researchers better understand that and take that into account in um, research studies. It's not about extracting data from people, it's about co-creating an object that we're going to learn from. Visit our website, networkcanvas.com, to learn more. Yay! <clears throat> it's like, this is a very early, this isn't officially, like I'm not allowed really to be showing you guys this, but I was like, guys, you need to see this because it can just communicate it so much better than I can. But yeah, I think it's amazing like what a video can like really sort of make it seem so much more real than like all of the work you do every day. It's amazing. Um, yeah, so that kind of gives you, you know, an idea. Actually, before I go back to the PowerPoint, what I want to do next is show you guys um, some software. So I just, I tossed around, it's, it's headed towards you. Um, so I have the architect running with a, uh, a developer protocol on the iPad. And so feel free to play with it. Um, just to get a sense of like, you know, how this kind of works and hopefully you're able to sort of see some of the actual more networky parts. There's lots of potential. That protocol I'm going to show you is really large because it's a developer protocol. So we're trying to test out every little bit to make sure, you know, it's, it's running appropriately. So the first thing I'm going to do, um, actually, why don't we start just with our um, with application. Um, so I can show you guys what's going around if you haven't seen it yet. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's see. The first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to open up the development protocol. I have one going right now. I guess I can just, I'll just resume it. I entered some data already. Um, and so this is, you know, the already created protocol. This is like what a participant would see. On, um, so the first thing you might want to include would be like, Something, this is the ego form. So this is like where you're getting data about that person, that participant right there. Not their network, but just like data about them. So what's your name, what's your age, some other stuff. Okay, and this is one of the first name generators. So we have multiple different kinds, but this is one of the most common ones. Um, so this is a name generator that is allowed, it's asking you like a very specific question, and you're going to be nominating somebody by pushing that button. Um, and you put in some information about them, and you can add them. And now they're an object that can appear in the rest of your interview. Um, you can also uh, port in data from other interviews, from CSV documents, so if you have uh, a roster, um, you can bring that over. Um, and so it, there's also like support then for longitudinal data capture, which is really great. So if somebody gives you a, a list of their 10 best friends and all of these demographics, you can bring in that list from last time, port that in, and then they don't have to re-enter all that data. Um, I'm just going to kind of skip through, and so you guys can get a sense of you know what this looks like. Um, and so this is a, another example of like this is somebody who's porting in a, a long list with CSV, um, and so you know you can have a whole roster of individuals, a little network. Um, oh, this is cool. So this is a name generator um, that really is trying to be as quick as possible. It's not so like what the first time I added somebody, there was all these follow-up questions about that person. And we tried to make that form so like when, you know, somebody might need a keyboard. So we try to like make it so when they're entering the name of somebody and they actually have to type, they will also be able to enter in any other information that is like you might need to use a keyboard for. So like age or like anything else we kind of suggest there. But if you really just want name, you don't care about other stuff, 
um, you can do it really quickly. So this one is adding, I was thinking like instead of people that you're friends with, this could be um, like places you go. So I was starting to do like your favorite uh, uh, fast food places. So Taco Bell, <coughs> give me some other ones. Favorite fast food. I think I did that at another screen sometime. Okay, let's see. So you can just like really quickly start to like make a list of, of different places. So kind of cool. Um, other venue prompts. So you kind of got a preview of this. I haven't talked about this very much, but another thing that I think I, I really love about our software is that we do these ordinal bin variables um, and we try to make them also very physical. And so what you're able to do here is you're able to really quickly get a lot of information about your relationship with a bunch of different people. So this one is contact frequency. Um, and we try to use visuals to like denote what you're asking. And so last 24 hours, you know, and using color, for example, to like really help you sort of um, understand what, what's being asked there. Um, let's see, I'm just gonna kind of skip through really quickly, show you some other stuff. So this is cool. So you can also preload um, not just like the roster that I was showing you guys, but another thing you can preload is um, say that you want to um, preload like venues or places. So what we have here is HIV, places in Chicago where um, people might get HIV services. And so we have a long sort of list and we're just um, putting those in. You can also filter. So say that there's, uh, you know what you want. Okay, so you want Howard Brown, but there's lots of locations. One on Broadway or the one on Clark Street. So you can have Clark. Um, so we try to build in filtering for things like that so people can get to the person that they want or the venue or whatever it is really quickly. Um, let's see. Kind of go a little bit further. Mm -hmm. Oh, the other thing I'll show you is that you can skip around to different interview stages. So either, you know, uh, the interviewer might do this. Um, oops, let's go back and resume where I was. Um, so this is uh, when you are um, like starting to lay out people onto the sociogram and then creating ties. Um, so I've already filled this in a little bit, but just to give you a sense of like how easy it is to start to create ties um, or how easy it is to delete ties. Um, yeah, and so it's just clicking one node and then clicking another and you can make ties. Um, you can create multiple different kinds of ties. So if you have friendship and you also want to indicate sex and you also want to indicate drugs or whatever it is, it's pretty easy to. You can also, um, this one's a little bit harder to see, but I'm selecting certain nodes and so you can also toggle on and off certain nodes. So say like you're asking like, who do you go to for advice? And you want to capture it on this kind of screen, you can. Um, yeah. The other thing I'd say is that we're offering a lot of flexibility. So like you saw concentric circles in the background there, but you can enter whatever you want. And so we offer that option for the concentric circles or you can upload your own images. And so this is an example of, we would expect somebody to put their own you know, image on there. So maybe there's some other organizi organizing structure you want people to place the nodes on top of. Um, maybe there's um, some sort of a, like a, a map or a simple kind of map that you want to. And you can um, port out um, things like, uh, you know, where on the picture, on the image, that person is latitude, longitude, which is great. Um, okay, I don't want to spend too, too much time on this because there's so much I want to show you still. Um, let's see if there are any others. One thing I'll say too is that we did not, in, in the original, um, in our original work, we did do a lot, we did an interface specifically around maps. And that one was really lovely because we were able to embed um, the census tract polygons onto the map and like immediately get, you know, individuals in their network and drag on what the per perceptions of the respondent, where that person lived, which was amazing. But one of the difficulties that we found is um, trying to make a system that would be flexible enough for any researcher who wanted to do that with the resources that we had. So that wasn't a huge priority, but that's one of the things we're thinking about for the future is trying to build maps into this. So right now we're really prioritizing uh, network data collection. Um, I'm just gonna skip, oh, one thing I wanted to show 
was um, the narrative interface. And so um, this interface is really cool because a lot of what we do is really for you know quantitative researchers, but we also want to be very supportive of qualitative researchers too. And so this screen really uses the network as an object for eliciting something, um, a story of some sort. And so what a researcher can do is to create certain presets that will display the network that's already been created in the interview in a certain way. So for example, this is showing you know, certain kinds of ties. This is showing, um, so people were indicated if they, were, if they gave advice. That's, um, and so you have three nodes highlighted here. Um, if I had answered it, oh, I did indicate Jay is a close friend. So you can like create certain presets and then make sure that they are visible. And then the cool thing about this is that you can actually interact with the image um, and it frees up the researcher so they're not paying so much attention to the physical process of like making the network, drawing on the network. All of this stuff can be captured by the software and the, what the interviewer can really focus on is doing the interview and making that relationship with the participant. Um, and so yeah, this hasn't been like a huge, huge focus of us but we're so proud of it and want to kind of continue building out like modules like this. Um, so we think there's so much value in it. Um, click the thing. Click the thing. Um, so you can also embed audio, you can embed your images, you can embed videos, whatever it is. Um, and you can use Markdown. Um, and then for finishing the interview, you can export it. I do have the server linked uh, to this, and um, so I could export this, and it would go um, to. Oh, never mind. Well, I'm not on the internet, so that's why. But, uh, and or you could download it directly, and then you download it, and it saves as GraphML. So you could open it there. Um, do you want to delete this on the machine? Sure. Um, and you can load multiple protocols. So maybe there's multiple studies that you're running. Um, so that is the architect. Um, or sorry, the app. I really need to get these names straight. Okay. Yes, let's exit. Now let's shift real quickly. I want to show you architect. Yes, open. Okay. So architect. Hmm is where we build the protocol. So, um, so I have a couple, I'm gonna do the one that's already, this is the protocol that we, I just showed you on, um, on the app. I just showed you this, and so this is the development protocol, super long, but this is what it looks like. So 22 interfaces, um, this is actually a very long one, probably much longer than most, but you can kind of see that, you know, we tried to keep it very visual. We tried to keep it um, very intuitive um, in terms of like how these interfaces sort of fit together. Um, we have a number of different forms. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, actually, I'm gonna show you a new one from scratch. Um, let's create. Okay, this is our test protocol. And I'm just gonna misspell them. Um, and let's add. And so what kind of interface do you guys want to see? Um, do you want to start with a name generator? What kind? Yeah, which one? Okay, sounds good. Um, okay. Um, so the first thing we're going to specify is what kind of node, because you can have multiple kinds of nodes. You can have people, you can have places, you can have healthcare providers, you can have smells, you can have, you know, whatever it is that you're interested in, you can create. And so that's um, important is that we're trying to create um, that you can create different kinds of nodes. And so for some screens you might be pulling in the persons to ask questions. For some you might be pulling in the fast food restaurants, whatever it is. So this is a person, I'm gonna use that icon for them. Continue, cool. Um, and do I wanna do a quick ad or do I wanna do a form? Let's say I just wanna do the quick ad. That thing where you're just like pumping out names one by one, sounds good. And the prompt, what is this person's name? 
And then let's do. Cool. Um, add side panels if you want to pull in things. So just trying to give you guys a sense of like how it's actually pretty easy to do most of this. Um, narrative interface. Oh, what else can I show you? The things I would say here is that so for name generators, we're we've tried to create name generators that are um, more like you're really doing a participant interview about asking them like how many friends do you have and they're just like creating a list of names that's like one kind another kind that we're also doing is a roster so if, if you have individuals that you want them to be pulling from on the sidebar that's another way um, and then for both of those we've done either like a quick ad for the name generator or something that's a little bit more involved or doing um, a small roster name generator, so say you only have under 100, versus a large roster. So that would be like if you have over 100. It might be a use case that some people might have. Um, for sociograms, that's when you are creating ties in between alters. Um, and that's also when you might be um, showing the sociogram to elicit data. So you might be drawing on the uh, screen as in a narrative interface, or selecting certain um, nodes um, or creating ties. We have different name interpreters. So I showed you the ordinal bin one. There's also categorical bins. There are more in-depth forms where you can ask a lot of questions about alters, about certain edges. Um, the ego form I showed you guys in the beginning. And then the utilities is just screens that are like giving direction of some sort. So that might be when you're embedding videos. That might be when you are giving instruction, like a lot of text, maybe audio something in between when you're actually capturing the data. So that's an overview of that. And let me switch real quickly to show you the server. Open. So again, server, you can have multiple protocols going on in the field at one time. And so you can switch between them. Um, and so I just did this right before. Um, this is developer protocol that I showed you in both in Architect and in the application. I uploaded one of my interviews already. This is just where you're able to gather all of, uh, all, all of the data that's being captured from your field devices into one spot, um, get a summary of high level things about what's going on. We automatically are creating some visualizations based on you know, what uh, variables are in the protocol. So you can start to get like a sense of what's going on. Um, we did not want to be a tool that was doing the analysis or a tool that was doing the visualization because there's other things out there that do a much better job at that. So we really want to be a tool for data capture. Um, and so then you can export. Right now we have GraphML and CSV set up. Um, I think we'll be also adding many other options, but let us know what you guys would like. Um, Treating edges as directed or not? Do you want to export the interview so every network is separate, or do you want like a union of all of them? Um, yeah, and what variables do you want? And so these are back to the variables that are in this specific protocol. So maybe you only want to export one variable for some reason. Um, yeah, and the reason that we have this setup with um, server, with architect, with you having so much control over this is because we wanted to be sure network data is so sensitive. You know, it is so important that privacy is maintained, um, especially with our work with HIV. It was so important that if you're getting name data and HIV status and sexual behaviors of, of primary subjects or secondary subjects in your studies, we don't want that data. We want to be sure that this was entirely researcher controlled. And so it's your responsibility then to house it and to make sure it's transferred in ways that are, um, you know, going to keep the data safe. So it was important for us that you know we made it pretty easy, and it is actually very easy. Um, so for um, adding, let's see if I can show you this. So when it comes to um, bringing in another, let's see. Mm, well, that's not the best way to show you, so I'm just going to not. But when it comes to pairing things, it's yeah. extremely easy. We have multiple different ways, so you can manually pair things or de automatically detect it over a network. Um, and so 
it, it's we really are trying to give you multiple sort of ways to setting up um, the connection so it, it'll be as easy as possible for you um, yeah and we just see that this is going to be so important for just keeping the data safe and and that was you know one of the the probably the biggest difficulty that people will have with us is that we have a, an assumption that you are actually doing that interview in person with a participant so we are not the software that if you want to email a link to a survey and have somebody complete it on their own, this is not the right tool for you because our assumption here is both for data security, data privacy, and also just for like the way that we see the strength of our data is that you know it's really an, an interaction between an interviewer and a participant. Um, we want the software to be downloaded on a device ahead of time the device should be owned by the researcher managed by the researcher um, just to make sure that everything is working appropriately so this isn't something somebody can like take on their cell phone for example although we do support a lot of different devices but when it comes to like trying to make a software that is acceptable for touch and for our nodes up to 40 or 50 um, we really needed to make sure the interfaces were big enough that would really sort of you know, work better on a tablet interface than like a phone. Um, and then also, um, but then also trying to be very flexible for Android devices, for Mac, for PC, all of that. I saw a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You answered part of it. Um, do these devices have to be encrypted at all? I mean, I, I, I it doesn't. That we, would, we would suggest, yes. But, okay. you know, and then it's just per IRB. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we definitely, and we've tried to think about ways of, so for example, um, like trying to make it so um, if somebody is uh, entering in an interview, thinking through like how, if it is a longitudinal interview, you're pulling up the right data. So like trying to make sure that you're really validating that. And so like ego ID is being really important there, like making it possible for the, the interviewer to really double check that this is the right person. So just trying to think through like how to maximize security. Mm -hmm. Not on my computer here, um, <clears throat> but I think in our beta we will make those easily, like usable for for you guys. So um, that will be something that should be pretty easy for us to share with you guys about what it actually looks like. But I don't have it on my computer right now. But I, I if I'm remembering correctly, it's just like a typical sort of edge test. It's it's very simple. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think respondents visualizing the social structure itself has an impact on data? And I mean, I mean, we as researchers say, like, yeah. oh, once we see the structure, it sort of helps us think a certain way. Or something. Yeah, I think it does. I mean, I I, have, I don't know in terms of like uh, how. I, you know, I think it absolutely does. I mean, what we find is that participants want to tell you stories. They, then it's a lot of times when people are visualizing their networks, they're like understanding a new layer that they didn't even know themselves and they just want to tell you about it, which is amazing. Um, and I do think that they likely, but it's, it's hard because it's like, what is the, the gold standard to compare it against, you know? Um, I'm not suggesting it's good or bad, but yeah. method collection. It absolutely does. It's interesting, even just asking people questions, like they got five people on a roster and you ask them, like, how many times a year do you talk to person A, the yes. first person? By the time they get to person five, they don't remember what they said necessarily what they said about person one, but, yes. but visualizing may be different. Mm -hmm. There's upsides and downsides of both, so I didn't know if you yeah. and your team had kind of talked about. I mean, we are starting to do a little bit of that, but more needs to be done, especially with that ordinal bin. I feel like that's something we haven't looked at at all yet. Um, I, what I hope is that, I mean, one of, uh, I think, my, my issues with network the network field for so long is that somebody does one study and it's so difficult to replicate that exactly because you don't even though if they give a really detailed review of how that data was captured it could be very different in real life even like when you're talking about physical methods and like the amount of training and interview receipts all of that I'm hoping that this is a way of standardizing things in a way that you can actually share your protocols of like hey this is my protocol I made in Network Canvas, why don't you try doing it in your study and seeing what happens, seeing if you get the same data. Um, so one thing down the line with our website, what we want to do is create a library of protocols that people can share if they so choose. Um, and maybe we can actually 
start to, to see how these things perform across populations, across studies. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Yeah. Are people allowed to like, edit things in real time? Let's say they have people, they have the network, and they're like, wait a minute, mm -hmm. me and Sally aren't as close as me and Frank, so let me. Yes. Like, so they can kind of make yes. adjustments. So they, they can, and it shouldn't mess things up as long as, so if you go way back in, in, in that protocol, many stages, keep skipping through and update all of the screens. Don't just like go straight back to where you were because something might have altered some skip logic in somewhere. So you're just gonna wanna like go back through. And it could be really quick, like if you're just updating one individual who got added to all of the screens, it actually won't be that long. But that, that would seal the caveat. Mm -hmm. Yes, is it possible to record this session on both like in terms of the movements and then what the participants might say, especially for like the qual component or like sometimes participants will just talk you through yeah. way more than what you've asked them and that would be <laughs> nice to capture. Yeah, that is something we are not doing it, like it's not implemented in the current version right now. Um, that is absolutely where we wanna go. But the reason it's not is because it kind of bloats the, the session so quickly with the amount of data. And so we're working on that right now. But yeah, that's exactly where we wanna go with it. Is like recording that audio would be so amazing, and then being able to play back both the audio and then the visual at the same time to like really replay the interview would be really cool. Yeah. I'm just curious about your participant reaction. Have you done any like usability studies with this, or have you, um, you know, I, I, I would assume that you would gain like quicker report. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. I think so, absolutely. Um, and we did do a usability study that's that the Kai paper that um, I showed a little earlier, but in that one. Like we did lots of different services, comparing the data collected here to typical data on sexual networks um, collected in uh, more traditional comedy partners that you had sex with, um, being able to compare against the same people, different time points, um, showing that the data was very similar um, in terms of quality, um, being able to ask about usability measures and high usability, and then also getting some qualitative responses. And that's what the worst thought you guys saw about interesting, fun, cool. So people like, really liked it. And this is like young men have sex with men in Chicago, um, a third African American, a third Hispanic, a third white, um, like 16 to. Oh, oh, it was it was part of the same project. So we embedded it within the like, cohort study. Um, yes. Yes. Um, so I don't remember actually where we landed on that. I'd have to look back. One of the difficulties, so I think in the cognitive social structures, we, we talked a lot about that um, because we wanted an ability to collect cognitive social structures, but then um, directionality becomes so important. I can't remember, honestly, off the top of my head if we decided to include it or not. I have to move back to it. But that was something that came up towards the end, of, like trying to think of like other use cases that are outside of what we typically do, um, but like trying to do um, directionality. I think it, it absolutely is possible. I'm just not sure if we felt good enough about it to include it in the, in the release coming out. Um, so just want to shift real quickly to back to the PowerPoint, the sort of talk about where we're at, our current activities. We have a public beta that is being released in June. Um, so this is, we've had three years of our project so far. We've just been trying to build all this stuff and we've been really like, a lot of people have reached out to us and been like, just wait, just wait for the beta. Um, so that's coming out, which is really exciting. Uh, right now we're just fixing random bugs and just getting the beta ready. Um, so we're working on that release. We're working on dissemination, and so year four of our project is really focused on, I mean, year four and year five, really, just dissemination and trying to like get this public beta, and the beta is a time for people to tell us what's wrong with it. So you can download it when it becomes available in June, it'll be publicly available. We will say, you can do what you want with it, but be careful, because it's a beta. We don't know what's gonna happen, if it's gonna work right for you. So don't <coughs> use it to collect important data, because you never know. And also, we don't have the bandwidth or the resources to really like, walk you through. If you have some really important data that got lost, we're not gonna be able to necessarily really walk you through that process. And so, um, but we would love for you guys to start to play with it, 
use it, give us feedback. It's not necessarily a time for us to be thinking about like adding new features, but it's more of like solidifying what we have and making sure it's really ready for the final release um, that'll happen the next year. Um, we're also focused on starting dissemination activities. And so um, this is a preview of that. Um, we're doing a workshop at Sunbelt um, that is in June. Um, and that'll be a six hour workshop. Um, and at that workshop, we are going to help you build your own protocol. Um, so if you're interested, please sign up. Um, we're also focused on our website. And so we have a website right now. So please go to it. It's really vague and, and short right now. On the back end, what we're doing is, um, and will be updated very soon, is we're making huge tutorials about all of this documentation, how to build a protocol, how to do all of this stuff, how to link server, to architect, and et cetera. And so we're, we're working on all of that. Another part of the website that's really important for us is that we've built a forum that people can do it, they can submit things anonymously or they can have a profile in there and just be a part of that community and help us understand what's breaking for you, what isn't working, um, if you can upvote issues. And so we can get a sense of like what's important, what should be prioritized. But that forum is really gonna help drive our beta period and, and, and after that, it, trying to um, understand what's important to focus on uh, fixing first, basically. Um, and the other thing I put up here is next steps, and this is like really something I'm thinking about right now, is where to go next in terms of um, getting grant funding. And so this is NIH funded, which is amazing. Um, you know, I, I'm in a soft money environment, so I'm always sort of thinking of like, okay, I wanna do this work, but how do I get the funding to do that work? Um, and so the, the areas, the two areas I'm really excited about are the mapping interface and then also the, the building up the qualitative portion. So I'm starting to think about what would grants look like to really expand the software into those areas as well. Um, so researchers can build maps into um, their data function and then have more qualitative components. So that's sort of the way I think. Um, we are also welcome. So the other thing is, you know, how can you get involved? Our software is open source. Uh, we're on GitHub. Feel free, visit our GitHub. You can go ahead and play with you know, what we have, and it's not you know, the beta version, but um, that's coming soon. Um, feel free. Um, many people have forked um, Network Canvas already, and they can play with it. So um, if you guys are familiar with Marta, she was one of the participants in one of the first uh, workshops, forked uh, Network Canvas, and was able to utilize it and study with the early version, which is amazing. Um, you know, there's definitely possibilities there. The thing we'd say with like, if you want to build something yourself, feel free if you want to build like additional components. Um, if you want it integrated back into our main sort of software, talk with us and see like what the limitations of that might be, what our, um, you know, how we can handle that. If there's additional developer resources, maybe there's ways of getting that funded. Um, so we could do that. Um, sort of overthinking. I would ask you guys all to join our mailing list. If you are interested in especially knowing when um, workshops are happening or when the beta will be released, um, please join our mailing list. That's how we are gonna be communicating. Um, so we have to email in a few weeks for that. Attend a workshop. I already mentioned Sunbelt, um, which is, uh, this is the info for Sunbelt. Um, we're also, well, we will have a presence at USIN. Um, I'm trying to think what else. There are discussions about doing a specific workshop on the East Coast, probably at Columbia, it looks like, um, in the fall. And so as folks sort of have reached out to us and wanting like more like hands-on in-depth training, we're starting to um, say yes to some of those things, but we're just trying to be mindful of like, um, trying to make sure as many people as possible can get to as many of these. So, you know, um, so if you're interested, um, there might be some options there. Um, yeah, so just thank you.